please put your hands together for two of the many gentlemen behind Alita Battle Angel, director Robert Rodriguez and producer John Landau. telling Robert before the show that uh, I've been able to see little bits and pieces of footage as they become available, but every single time it's not enough. Like I want to... good reaction. Right. I want to see more and more and more. So, just like we did a minute ago with the X-Men guys, can we start at the beginning, John, and talk about how this project came to be so we have context for everything that we're about to see, which is a lot, by the way. So back in 1999, Jim Cameron and I were introduced to Alita by our friend Guillermo del Toro. We, we looked at it and we saw in it a character whose story we felt needed to be told. So much so that Jim identified it as a movie he wanted to direct. And he set out writing the script. And, and Jim took, takes his time on writing these scripts, as many of you know. And he didn't come up with a script that he was happy with until 2005. At that same point in time, we felt that our technology was there to do another movie Jim had written 10 years earlier, Avatar. And Jim was really torn about which movie to do first. He went back and forth. And in small part, because he felt that Avatar would in fact help Alita more, that he thought it would be better to do Avatar first, and which we did. We have come to learn it was quite the opposite, that the Avatar sequels are going to benefit much more by what we've learned by, by going through Alita. And once Jim got into the world of doing Avatar, knew he'd be directing that for a while, Alita was not something that we wanted to put on the back shelves and wait. And we started looking for a director. But we had to find a director who would co-parent this child with us. And one who understood and valued the themes of the movie that Jim had written in. Because I always say that Jim writes into his movies themes that are bigger than their genre. The theme is what you leave the theater with. The plot is something you leave at the theater. And we met several different people and we couldn't find the right marriage, per se. Until one day, Jim was having a social lunch with Robert Rodriguez. And it wasn't until the end of the lunch where I think Robert said to Jim, well, if you're going to be doing avatars as a director for this foreseeable future, what happens to movies like Alita? And a light bulb went off on Jim's head. He said to Robert, do you have 15 minutes? And he showed Robert an art reel we had done in 2005. He gave Robert his way too long, close to 200 page script, and 600 pages of notes on Alita. And said, if you can crack this, you can direct it. And Robert went away for, I think, four months. No deal in place, unheard of in Hollywood. And he came back and presented us with a script. And we couldn't figure out what was missing. I mean, we knew things were missing, but the heart and the soul of the characters and the story was there, and that told us that Robert was the right person to do this movie with. That blows my mind, first of all, that it's like, it sounds like the beginning of a joke, like Robert Rodriguez and James Cameron are having lunch, <laughs> right? Uh, when he says, like, do you have 15 minutes? Like, after, it, was a, it was after a four hour, it was after a four hour lunch. So oh my God. That, I was like, okay, you should probably get, I've probably taken you away from work for way too long. You should probably get back to work. I was literally getting into my car. And then, and, then <laughs> and he's like, wait, 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 wait. And then I said, because it still stuck to me that he was going to be doing mostly the avatars. And as a fan, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, this is, this is my place. This is, I'm like these guys. I'm a fan of Jim Cameron. And, uh, and I was like, well, what am I going to see this Alita Battle Angel movie? He said, I probably won't ever get to make it. You got 15 more minutes? I was like, Four hours and 15 minutes? Fuck yeah, he's going to show me some real time. Because he had shown me, and I've known Jim 25 years, so we've been friends a long time. And um, he had shown me an early reel like that of Avatar. It was 15 minutes. It's all the key art that he had done with voiceover, narration, music. And it's like watching the movie in 15 minutes. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. And then, of course, it's Avatar later. You see it. So now I knew what that meant to see an art reel. And you can kind of figure out what that's going to look like in his hands. And I was just... It had the girl with the porcelain arms, which you'll see in the very first scene, with the large manga eyes, photoreal painting. And I was stunned. I went, oh, shit, he's doing that. And he was going to do that in 2005? How? But that's Jim. He's always pushing the envelopes. The technology has to catch up to his brain and his vision. 
And it wasn't 600 pages. It was only 600 pages out of 1,000 that he gave me because that's how he writes. And it's not like notes like you and I would take. This is notes that are very thorough and very organized and help me craft the script to get it down the lane. Not that he couldn't have done it. He just kind of put it aside and went to Avatar and never really got back to it. That's why it was so long. He never did that sort of shrink wrap version of it. So I, I went and did that for him. It's a thousand pages or 600 that he gave you. That's a ton of work. It's four months worth of work. And with that, you know, with filmmakers like you guys, every day counts. So it was very helpful, you know, because when you take something out of a script, you have to replace it with something to be connective tissue. And I, I loved his script so much. It was not like reading scripts that I usually read. When you read a script by someone like him or Quentin, these are writer directors where you're reading it and you see the whole movie that they that they, in their that they have in their head, and you love that movie, and you realize we just can't shoot one that's that long. So I'm going to pretend like it's already been shot by him, and I'm going to be just an editor cutting things that may not be needed so we can get it down to a manageable length. That was the approach I took. So um, that helped because he read it and goes, hey, this is a script I love because it was, it was all his script. And, you know, you talked about waiting the four months. Four months didn't seem at all long because we've been involved with the project for so long. And, you know, the first thing that Jim did uh, when we found out about the rights, he actually made a trip to Tokyo. And he sat down with Kashiro, the author, and really made a commitment to him to hold true to the characters in the world he created. And we looked at Alita not as so many other mangas are that come out of you know, Japan. It's, it's not set in Asia. It's set in a universal melting pot world. The central character is not Asian. But, but the style of the character is very specific to a manga. We wanted to hold true to that. And we've kept uh, Kashiro involved throughout and, and, and uh, shared with him, and he was kind enough to do something he seldom does. He actually recorded a brief message for us to play for you, uh, the fans here at Comic-Con today. So uh, maybe we could run a message from Kishiro. Oh my god, I have so many questions. Okay, once again, filling these mysterious two empty seats, let out all that pent-up energy and excitement for Rosa Salazar and Kean Johnson. I'm going to toss you a question in a second, uh, but first I have to confess something that a couple days ago I was talking to John, and I was just talking about like all my different experiences over the years with mocap, and then John, oh, no. would you like, I know, right? So John can... You got the talk, I got the talk. So we feel that, that, that mocap was always missing one very key letter in front of it, an E, for e-motion capture. Mm -hmm. So when we started doing Avatar, we started referring to it, once we started recording the face at the same time we were recording the body, as performance capture. Because we want to capture the incredible performances that our cast get, and not just the motion that they give. And uh, so we try and indoctrinate everybody in referring to it as performance capture, because that character you saw up on the screen, all of the, the little quirks and nuances in the face, and the scenes with Kristoff and, and Kean and others, that's all driven directly from the performance that Rosa gave us on the set while we were filming the other characters. So we call it performance capture. So thank you for making me hip by telling me that. So now you guys know so you can take it and put it out into the world because that is a great way that we can honor all of these great performances because that's what they are now. Absolutely. It's a great point. You know, we, we look at it as what we're doing with creating CG characters is we're allowing actors and actresses to play characters they could not otherwise play. If we wanted the human version of them, we would simply shoot them, but we don't. We want a character they can't play, and that's what Rosa gave us. Okay, so let's dive into that, because I can't fathom how you one would go about preparing for a role that's as physical as this, and that's so... The finding the balance between human and not, you know, can you just talk about starting that process? It seems like it might be overwhelming. 
Uh, well, uh, I was cast in the role, and then the very next morning I went into training. Um, <laughs> Jim and Robert and John were talking about, uh, you know, you don't want to cast someone and then you just, you get two takes out of her and then she's exhausted. You know, you gotta, you gotta get your endurance level up for something as physical as this. So I went into training the very next morning and uh, I trained for uh, close to five months, um, for a few hours every single day. Um, and uh, I, I did some Muay Thai, some Kung Fu, um, staff work, kickboxing. Um, and it was all about physically preparing myself. And I did get strong, but it also uh, mentally prepared me. I mean, the thing about martial arts is that it's mind, body, and soul. So uh, it really helped me in, in, in all regards uh, take on this role. Um, other than that, the performance capture suit was sort of, uh, it informed also, because, you know, I'm a walking contraption at this point. I have a battery pack and a fan and a recorder and a mic and a helmet and a titanium boom and a suit, a gray suit, so I was a piece of technology walking around. Um, and then from there, her physicality, you know, she's not a, a human who slouches in her seat. She does have some posture uh, differences, but, but other than that, you know, she's, she's mostly human um, in the way that she gestures and, and, and um, you know, her mannerisms. But I, I had to really work on my posture um, because, you know, she's, she's, you can see she stands very upright all the time. And, and that was kind of a, a challenge for me because I'm very much a, like, hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm like listening to you right now and realizing I'm like this. Hey, what's up, yeah? Yeah, very not Alita. Um, Kian, am I correct in, in saying that your background is really heavily in Broadway? Uh, yeah, I started dancing when I was five um, and then did a Broadway show for about three and a half years. Which um, is so intense. That's really, it's crazy hard work. Yeah. How did that translate into, you, you know, this film? Um... I mean, you definitely learn, uh, this is my first film. Um, it's all downhill from here, dude. It's all down, no, truly, 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 truly. When, when your first day on not, set. Not for Kian, he's great in the movie. Bright, bright, bright future. I don't know, when your first day on set is with Christoph Waltz, I don't know if it gets better than that. Um, no, uh, I mean, definitely learning about physicality, um, starting as a dancer and, and, you know, acting is so much about physicality. Uh, to create a character, how he moves every single day, um, and then other than that, just um, the difference between Broadway is you always have to project, and so on film you have to learn how to be subtle, so this was definitely an interesting test in learning how to um, let the camera do a lot of the work. <laughs> right, so you're not like, hello, Alita. Exactly. Know, That's how I did the first take, and Robert uh, had some second thoughts on who he should cast. <laughs> I, one of the things that strikes me when I watch the clip of the orange is that uh, a, a certain amount of this film is about sort of the joy of discovery of what makes us human. Did Was that what was in your the forefront of your mind while you were kind of guiding everyone? Well, yeah. I mean, you wanted to have this very... It, it's an opportunity to see the world through someone else's eyes. In her eyes, she says she has no memory. She, she sees everything. In a, in a new way, in a beautiful way. And everyone else who lives there goes, you know, we live in a dump. But she thinks it's awesome. And so it changes, she changes everyone that she meets. And so you wanted to get that from the very first eye open, that everything is amazing and everything is beautiful. And she doesn't, she gets a second chance at life and to see life in a different way. So it was all about that. And, and, um, and she just performs it so beautifully. That's what I... I, you weren't sure yet, but you saw the performance you got on set. You were just hoping, you know, you could get seventy-five percent of that in the performance. I mean, in the CG performance. And Weta is just at the top of their game. That's just how Jim rolls now. He's just like, they're doing all the effects, and um, he he wouldn't trust it with anyone else. And they just did such phenomenal work. They had to come up with new technology to capture that because it, you want the technology to go away. You want to just be able to watch it and appreciate her as a character and feel the journey that she goes on from that first eye open to knowing exactly who she is and what she has to do by the end. You know, it's funny, you mentioned the orange scene and 
That scene, and, a, and another scene which I'll get to in a second, they're much more difficult than the action scenes. That, that interaction of taking a physical prop and putting it in a CG character's mouth. And some of you might not like oranges, but we have another scene <laughs> later in the movie where everybody, I think, likes chocolate, where Alita has her first bite of chocolate. And, and, and that scene has truly proven to be one of our more challenging, and we, we've cracked it. But it's, it's, it's the things you don't think about. The dog in the, in the scene, yeah. licking her face, all of those things. Weta, Robert, Rosa, they had to make it all feel seamless. When Jim does uh, science fiction, he calls it more science fact. It isn't like the, the whimsical. It has to be really grounded. You know, so it, it's, it was about building real sets around her to interact with. And so it made it much more difficult than, say, an avatar, where you have an alien creature in an alien world. Well, who, who knows what a plant really looks like? Here you know if it doesn't look real, so it, it had the work cut out for them. Can either of you guys speak to, this is like kind of a deep dive question about what a, did, you were talking about new technology. Like, the thing about what, as I understand it, is that they're kind of, they develop this amazing software that's responsible for how great their movies look. So was there something specific that they did for this movie you can talk about? Well, well there, there was, and, and there continues to be. You know, Weta never stands on the laurels of their past. Uh, so, and, and I love Caesar. They did a phenomenal job on Caesar. Uh, but Caesar was able to hide behind, you know, an ape face uh, wrapped, wrapped in fur. Here, they were exposed. They had to deliver in the lips, in the mouths. And what they've really worked on is on the inside out working on a system that is not driving the facial performance from the outside, but understanding what the muscles are doing under the skin and then moving the skin. And we, we talked, Rosa came out, and one of our artists talked to Rosa about all of the idiosyncrasies that she does that, that we're not supposed to be able to do, that this eyebrow will go up, but this lip will go down. And no one else does that, but Rosa does it. I wouldn't so. say he disgust. I would say he interrogated. He's like, what, do you, what does your face do? And why is it doing that? What are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. So I don't know. It was Weta learning and teaching their system from the inside out, which is a, a brand new thing they're doing, and really pushing the technology. Yeah, because you know, it used to be that if a CG character, the biggest issue with CG was that like if a CG character fell on the ground, like we saw a shot like that, it used to feel like there was no weight to it. Right. But now it feels like there's weight. You feel it. It's not just the sound design. You're like, damn, that is a big machine. And But it... None of it's real. Even even Alita herself is a is, you know she's made out of metal, and so when she goes down uh, into the water and she lands, you see the dust uh, rise, and 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 you know I feel the same way. You want to feel the weight of her. You want to. That's part of what makes her real. But more importantly, Rose is not performing against a green screen. She's yeah. out there, and we, we built a 97,000 square foot set on the back lot of Troublemaker Studios, where you know Kian could go on a scene on, on a bridge in the rain, with Rosa right there, tenderly touch her cheek in a very yes. romantic scene yeah. that you you couldn't do before. But Weta and pushing the technology is allowing the actors to to really do performances with each other. Oh my God, let's talk about that set. Okay. Let's do it. Because I have I was there South with Southwest. alcohol, yeah. Oh, it was yeah. amazing. <laughs> but I, when, you're, when you're shooting a movie, I mean, that is, it sort of is like a, a Broadway set, like a theatrical set as well. So being on set, describe it. How much of this is real versus how much well, is CG? Well, it's, it's, it's all real. I mean, I was given the, the gift of um, being able to perform this character in performance capture, but also the gift of living in a existing in a practical environment with practical props and practical people and never, you know, with the, with the exception of one day working on a green screen uh, stage, all the other days were in the real, true uh, environment of that set. And, and it's so rich, that world, and that's a gift. If your filmmakers are giving you that kind of environment in which to play, um, half the battle is won. You're there. Just have, just have the things that you don't see as well. Like when we were shooting, 
every set you could just go into any of the buildings and they were fully dressed with couches and um, you know there's bars in the in the restaurant and like every, and even in the vents like there was fog coming through the vents so it really felt like a living breathing city and we had like 200 extras all in wardrobe uh, they created some practical looking if they're in the far background practical looking uh, robotic arms and stuff like that so you really and the the gyro bike that I ride is is it, it's not doesn't actually work, but they ma they made a, you know the actual bike, so it, it it all feels so real. How I I was gonna ask you about that. You read my mind. Like was that was it kind of towed or like did you just would they cut oh, oh, when you climbed oh, oh, onto oh, it? I'm sorry, John. I'm asking. It was, it was real. He got on it and he drove it. Okay. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The movie, the movie section wasn't towed. Yeah, but that one that he got on is an actual one that's it. That's awesome. I want it. Now, now the, funny, <laughs> the funny thing is that when we were prepping the movie, we found a company that actually made, today, single-wheel motorcycles. <laughs> and we got one, and it's, it's a much smaller version, but in scenes, you'll see it going around in the background. So it's, you know, art imitates life, life imitates art, and then the back-and-forth process. Well, I would say the same thing for prosthetics. If you're wearing a prosthetic, if you have a pacemaker, if you've got a titanium hip, you're not that far off from someone in Iron City. Or just holding your phone, you know. <laughs> That's the thing. Woo. The, the technology that we carry in our pockets and keep in our pockets for the duration of this panel. <laughs> John, is there ever a moment when you've worked on so many of these really visually groundbreaking films that... They mean so much to us on an emotional level. Do you ever just say, I, I don't think we can do that? Have you met John? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you see him up there? You know, um, I, I think there comes a moment, you know, on any challenge that, that you begin to question. Um, but that, that I serve as a challenge to you to, <laughs> to exceed and to move on and to do better. I remember, uh, you know, on, on a movie years ago on Titanic, um, Everybody was saying, we're not going to be able to build the ship, we're not going to be able to do this. And I went out to a bookstore, and I bought these books for people, all of our department heads, and I handed them the books, and I inscribed each one with, I know we can, I know we can. The book was the little engine that could. And the nice story about that for me is, you know, 15 years later, when we were doing Avatar, and people felt that same concern, a department head came to me with the book that I had given him 15 years earlier, and he said, I know we can, I know we can. And I think we can because of the people we surround ourselves with. But by finding someone like Robert, who is not afraid to embrace technology, to find te technology people that we stand on their shoulders, the artists who design these characters, and then the characters who play them, and they take the biggest risk. They're the ones who are out there exposing themselves, you know, really to the world. So we're up here standing on their shoulders, and it's that challenge that excites me. Robert, on a day-to-day -day level, when you're watching, you know, what you've shot that day, because it's, now, how, what's, so this was 3D, so it would have been... We shot it in 3D, the, yeah. You know, the 3D mm -hmm. cameras. So when you sit down at the end of the day, would you watch dailies of what you had shot that day just to see if you had gotten it? What was the day-to-day -day like? Well, you were watching it in 3D as it's yeah. happening. So I have this oh. big 3D screen there. I'm watching it. I mean, this is a movie, of all the movies I've done, where I felt more like an audience member than a director. Because you're watching it, and it's coming to life. And now, even still now, the effect shots are still coming in. And I'm seeing things that, you know, we shot a lot practical, but there's a lot that is computer generated that you haven't seen yet. And I see it and I'm blown away like an audience member going, when did we shoot that? You know, and it's really exciting. And it's like I'm seeing the movie, like an audience member in bits and pieces over the past two years. And I get that elation each time and it feels less like... When I make movies, usually it's me doing every freaking Everything. thing. Here, I have such an amazing team that I'm seeing all of their work, and I'm I'm seeing it more like a like a like an audience member than just out there like I'm out there doing it all. You know, it's like oh shit, so I'm totally surprised. Spe speaking of Robert doing everything, uh, it was funny. We had a, a brilliant, brilliant cinematographer, a DP named Bill Pope. Um, Matrix, Baby Driver. Uh, everything, Team America, Scott Pilgrim, all of your favorite movies probably. And um, and he's truly gifted. And it, <laughs> it's funny to watch Robert, like, you know, because he's usually got his hands on the camera. And he would just go over to Billy, so 
What you doing? <laughs> oh, cool. All right, well, I'll be over there. <laughs> and he just walked away. Like, he, he wanted to touch it so bad. And, but, like, you know, it was like, so much respect swirling around, you know, Jim to Robert, Robert to Bill, John to everyone. And But it was really funny to watch Robert be like, I'm not going to touch the camera. <laughs> One of the things that we really said to Robert, this is a different scale movie going into it. We talked early on about giving up some of those day-in and day-out responsibilities so he could focus on the bigger picture. So not only was it, you know, Bill Pope, not only we, we hired uh, Steve Rifkin as our one of our editors who did Avatar with us, and composing is something Robert normally does. But we went out and Robert picked a Chunky XL, who was done Fury Road and other movies. Yeah, this is the first time. It wasn't like... It wasn't like I had to give it up. It's like I didn't, I didn't do all those jobs because I just wanted more work. It was because I never had any freaking money. <laughs> but this time it was like, I can hire Bill Pope. And usually I would do the score on all my movies, even though I don't read or write music. Because when you're shooting a movie and you're going over budget, the first place you start taking money out of is your music budget. So by the time we'd get to the end of a movie, it'd be like, oh, I guess I'm doing the score again. <laughs> There's no money left for that. So it's like, you can hire a composer? Junkie XL, oh my God. The, the score from Fury Road was awesome. Let's get that guy. Because this has taken, sorry about that, because this has taken a little while in the you know process of getting everything in place effects-wise, is there something that you look at from early on where you're like, because you mentioned that you, you're getting surprised by shots that they were even filmed. Do you find them like, we should go back in and just tweak this one thing and do this other little thing? And No, you know, there's something we shoot, I shoot pretty fast because you, you want it to be really in the moment. I mean, the movie's only going to last two hours. You don't want to spend 200 days shooting something that's going to last two hours. It'll start feeling stilted. So there's an energy that's really palpable if you're moving at a fast pace where the actors can kind of stay in character. And but then the finishing work certainly to make it look like the world that you're trying to create that's what really takes the time, and those performances I think just feel more vital because they were done almost real time. So that I think that that nice mix of shooting with the energy of the low budget background that Jim and I come from, and yet finishing it out with uh, where he's at now as a filmmaker, which is creating dream imagery that you just never see. When you see sections, when I see sections of the movie that I've only seen in the graphic novel come to life, not like in a Sin City way where it looks like the graphic novel, but in photo real 3D, it feels like you're living, like you woke up in Kashiro world and you're just in a dream and it's just stunning. And I see now why Jim only wants to make movies in that realm because he's creating things that you could never see otherwise, even in any way in this lifetime. So it's, it's, it's intoxicating. It's really addictive. Yeah, sometimes I feel like when I watch his movies, and when I saw more footage from this, sometimes I feel like I've never seen a movie before. <laughs> I'm just like, Jesus, what am I watching? This is amazing. You know, our, our goal with each of our movies is to make people feel like they're going to the cinema for the first time again. We think there's something great about going in there, the lights turning down, and sharing a communal experience where there's so much division uh, in our society today, but to bring people together for entertainment, and, and entertainment that takes you to other worlds, but worlds that serve as a metaphor for the world in which we're in. Uh, speaking of which... So, you know, you talked about is there, is there stuff that, uh, you know, we're surprised by when it comes together. One of the things that we, you know, only captured performances, but we didn't do a lot of photographic filming, is for something called the sport of motorball. Motorball is something that Kashiro wrote into the fourth uh, of his graphic novels, and we were really focusing on the first couple. But Jim felt that it was so unique and so visceral that he found a way to weave it in to very critical story points in the development of Alita. So we'd like to share with you today a still very work in progress from a visual effects standpoint, very work in progress from a sound standpoint. It's in 2D, but Motorball will give you a hint that's something that no one in the world before this, today, right now, has ever seen from Alita. I call it a motorball sizzle reel. Again, it, it's... And, and I haven't seen it either, I, I so... <laughs> I truly am an audience member, and I have not seen this kind of stuff. But um, Jim said those who are fans of the graphic novel would be pretty disappointed if motorball wasn't in this movie. So he found a really cool Jim way to incorporate it, and it's really badass. So I'm, I'm excited to see what we're going to show you. But as I'm seeing it come in, I'm just like stunned because it's awesome. So take a look. You've got good, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I barely got into my chair, but. 
That's definitely just a taster. That sequence is an extended sequence, and there's a real story reason for it that's very compelling. In fact, that was the scene that made me um, want to do the movie the most, because as I was reading through the script, I got to this sequence, and I was literally jumping up and down in my seat because the stakes are so high. He's created a situation where it turns into a hunt, and she doesn't know what she's getting into. And I, I don't know, my email to Jim was, because we hadn't said, like, you can direct this if you figure it out yet. He just let me read it. And I said, this script is amazing. I identify with the Edo character and his daughter, but also identify with her and the world. It's, it's a complete vision of the future. I can totally see what you're doing. How many heads do I have to collect to work on this thing? Because that's the gag in there, is the bounty hunters collect heads. And he wrote back the next day in very Jim fashion, very short and sweet. You've collected enough heads. Call me tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, come on. I'm, I'm from this audience. You know, what would that feel like if you got an email like that from Jim Cameron? That's how I felt. I'm one of you guys. That was a one-line email, but I know that there are times during the shoot where you reached out to Jim with a very yes. simple one-line question and yeah. wanted to get back. Yeah, when I would write Jim during the movie, question, I don't want to bother him. I know he's busy, but I would write him a question. He wouldn't do that one answer. He would write back, like the engineer, creative person that he is, A, B, C, D, E. This is why it can be like this. And very helpful, very masterful, very much like a master class. That really helped me make the movie and feel like he was there the whole time. And it was 25 pages long. It was probably 25 pages long. I'm collecting a book just called What I Learned from Jim of all these <laughs> emails. Because <laughs> they're master classes in life lessons and in making films. Kian, were there ever times when you weren't involved in shooting that day that you would just show up to set to see what happened? Uh, uh, most of the time, yeah. Um, yeah, what was great is just being able to, like the whole, um, the whole sequence with um, Rosa and Aza and Kristoff, that the one that you guys saw, I, uh, that was the, the start of the night shoots, which went on for about a month or month and a half or so. So I was just like, I'll just stay up and just hang out with everyone and, and just watch this being made. What do you think was the biggest takeaway? Because I feel like I, I just, uh, I'm on that plane where I'm like, I just want to see what happens. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. Like what, what did, what did you take away that you might carry with you in, you know, your second movie? Uh, a, th a thousand things. I mean, from every department, from Weta, from Robert, from John, even Rosa, every actor, Kristoff, I, I tried to get a, you know, learn a little bit from everyone. Um, and what was great is every actor, um, especially Kristoff, um, you know, someone that has two Oscars on his belt, and uh, you, you kind of want to be respectful and maybe not talk about you know the craft too much, but then you get him talking, and he'll just talk for an hour and a half. So everyone on the set, Mahershala, Jennifer, everyone was just so um, actors who love acting, and that's rare. And Christoph Waltz, like, I think because of the characters that he usually plays very convincingly, they wouldn't think he's a really funny dude. But he totally is. He's hilarious. Were there any kind of like Kristoff stories that you guys remember or moments on set with him that you could share? It was just more of just like looks that he would, like you, someone would say something and then you'd look over at Kristoff to see his like facial reply yeah. and he would do his very Austrian like, hmm, and then like walk away, you know, it's very Kristoff, I don't know. Uh, one, one hilarious, we, we would go out to dinner a lot, we spent a lot of time together, just, he was playing my father figure and uh, and uh, we went out to, the first time we went out to dinner, um, you know, like, this is Christoph Waltz. He's, like, a really mean Nazi. He's, like, a guy who steals a woman's art. He's, like, you know, he, we've seen him play these guys that are, like, evil. And um, they have their motives, but they're evil, right, for all intents and purposes. And you go out to dinner with him, and he, <laughs> it's a little low lit. And he gets the menu, and just like a dad, gets out his phone and turns the, the flashlight on, and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm like, 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 that's so funny. And he's yes. laughing, too. And then, and then he's like, I don't know why they talk so loud when they enter a restaurant. I don't know why. And he's just like a human being dad. And it's just it's so heartwarming, because I'm like... The way you ate a strudel made me piss myself. Like, <laughs> and now you're like looking, like you're like doing the, the far away menu hole death thing. It's, it was, it's like, 
He, we went to Formula One together. What? what? Yeah, well, I, I forgot to mention this in all my other interviews. <laughs> oh my God. But he, we, he took me to the racetrack of the Americas in, in Austin, Texas. Um, and uh, it was just so much fun. It was like, we were, it was so joyous. And at one point we got a free Mer Mercedes hat. <laughs> And I placed it like gingerly on his head when he wasn't looking, and then he just walked around <laughs> like that for a while, like totally not acknowledging it, but like being so funny about it. Um, and then also, uh, I could go on forever, but like fans would come up to him and be like, "Hey, man, like I fucking loved you to Glorious Bosters, dude!" Like the, just the total antithesis of like this refined, elegant man. And he would res any way a fan comes up to him he responds the same energy. So he'd be like, all right, cool. Like, <laughs> I'm like, what? And he's like, I just, they give me and I give it back. And it's just, he's, he's fucking amazing. You can tell me and Rosa have tried to perfect the Christoph Waltz it's accent, just awesome. never will happen. It's, it's so awesome. hard. One time I told him, I'm like, okay, the, I have to go, my interview time is over. And he goes, oh, apocalyptic. <laughs> I'd also like for everybody just to let it sink in that you just a few moments ago, Rosa, made a Big Eyes reference. And that's a movie, but it's also a good, lead up. Good segue. Boom. Good segue. Look how blown away they all are. <laughs> and what we don't want is your big eyes on your phone. Put them away. <laughs> hey. uh, in fact, Rosa. You're wrong, because we have sadly reached the end of our time together. Now we get to do the awkward photo time. Get so big eyes out. And just, thank you. Thank you.